Ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> I'm Waldemar de Rijk from the School of Dentistry, and I'm you know, proud and happy to introduce our speaker today. Uh, before I start, that, I just have a couple of uh, comments. First of all, this is the second uh, event this semester. Uh, the first one was held at Rijk Auditorium, as you may recall, so we're back to our home base. Uh, for as far as housekeeping is concerned, you, you probably know we really have, like to have you sign in uh, on the sign-in sheet. So we have uh, your contact information and, of course, uh, our sponsor will continue to sponsor us. <clears throat> okay. uh, if you are a participant in the Wellness Passport Program, please see Lindsay before we start and after so you can get your stamp in case uh, that's part of your program. <clears throat> uh, the other thing is that this, these uh, presentations are sponsored by both the Laupus Library History Collection as well as the Department of Bioethics and Interdisciplinary Study. Uh, today, of course, specifically because our speaker is from that department, so I think the department is helping us out in more way than one. Okay. <clears throat> in addition to that, uh, collections uh, actually has two uh, exhibits going on at the moment. One of them is uh, Desegregation in Healthcare in Eastern North Carolina, and then there is a, a Bausch & Lomb microscope exhibit covering microscopes from 1884 to 1972. <coughs> and these events are here all on this, this fourth floor. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, for the rest of this semester, we have two more presentations planned. I hope you already reserved the date for that. March 27th is called, Call the Eastern North Carolina Midwife, Lovey Bird Shelton, 1950 to 2001. And it will be presented by Lisa Yarger, who has a master's in folklore, and she comes to us from uh, Munich, Germany. So I think that should be an, an interesting event, and hope we can give her uh, an audience at least. On April 10th, we have in the beginning the Tar Heel State and Public Health by Daniel Singleton, uh, retired now from the ECU Social Works Program. Again, I hope you have a chance to attend that as well. Today's presentation is titled Race, Medicine, Authorship, and the Discovery of Sickle Cell Disease, 1910-1911. And our presenter is Dr. Todd Savitt from the Department of Bioethics and Interdisciplinary Studies. Uh, Dr. Savitz trained at first at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and then went to the University of Virginia to get his master's and his PhD in history. Uh, he has been teaching medical history and humanities at the University of Florida until he reached ECU at the Brody School of Medicine in 1982. <clears throat> His research interests are primarily in African-American medical history and the medical history of the American South and the American West. And I think uh, from his list of publications, you'll see that he has uh, ext done extensive work on this. And I think we're really lucky to have an, an expert in this field among our own. And without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Sabat and have him give his presentation. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> thanks for the introduction and thank you all for coming. Uh, what I'm going to do is tell you a story and another story. I'm going to tell you a story about um, the first two sickle cell patients who were identified in the medical literature. And I'm also going to tell you the story of how I got the story. So it's uh, two stories in one. And I'll put up um, a picture of sickled cells. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the disease itself. Um, I'm going to assume that you all have some knowledge of sickle cell. Um, because the rest of my talk will take most of the time. And I'll be glad to talk about sickle cell afterwards um, if, if people are interested. Um, so you, some of, a little bit about sickle cell will come out in what I uh, am talking about as well. So I'm a social historian. And I'm going to talk about the discovery of sickle cell disease 
in Western medicine in that way as a social historian. We could just look at the basic facts, the kind of internal history, who did what when. We could say that there were articles published in 1910 and 1911 describing sickle-shaped red blood cells and that those were the first descriptions in the medical literature of sickle cell disease. But we're going to look at the people as well as these sort of dry dates and facts. We're going to look at the social history of this disease, who the people were that were involved and what brought them together. We know that sickle cell is important both scientifically and medically. But the history of sickle cell can also tell us something about the society in which sickle cell existed. We can talk a bit about the history of race in America as part of this story of sickle cell. So, I didn't, I made about 15 copies of, this is the front page of the article. This was the first article that was written about sickle cell disease. It was published in November of 1910. And I just wanted, if you wanted to look at it, you can. I know that some of you are not, don't have a strict interest in uh, medicine but I thought it would be interesting to see this. And it had a role in my doing what I did, tracking down this first sickle cell patient. So I was a medical student in 1965. I started medical school thinking that that was going to be my career. And it turned out it wasn't, and I won't go into that story. Um, I left medical school in 68 and became a historian. Um, but in 1965, when I first started medical school at the University of Rochester, I and my roommate were assigned um, an advisor. And this guy was a microbiologist who that year had a particular interest in sickle cell. Not sure exactly why, but he had us read a bunch of articles about sickle cell disease, the history, the um, the molecular biology, uh, the science of it, as well as the um, sum about the social aspects of it. So the first thing we read was this article. And I remember reading the article, and you see I highlighted some things up there. The article said, this is written by James B. Herrick uh, from Chicago, and it said that this patient was a professional student in Chicago from Grenada in the West Indies, that he was Negro, as the term was used then, intelligent and sickly. So a good medical student would have tried to go after the science part, and my mind went to, who was this dude? Who was this guy? I wondered who he was. What did he look like? What kind of person was he? That sort of thing. Of course, now, or then as now, patient anonymity is respected. And so the only identifiers are what I uh, mentioned and a few others in the uh, article, but not his name. So fast forward a few years. I left medical school in 1968 and um, decided, I had decided that I wanted to be a historian and took a year off, to, taught in high school in Rochester for a year and then got into the graduate program in history at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. So in 1970 or so, I can't remember the exact year, um, I was, uh, the archivist, strange, for the Health Sciences Library, something that would never happen now, but in the mid-60s in Charlottesville, 
I was, I had the keys to the health sciences library and I could go in any time and I had access to all of the books and stuff that was there. I was wonderful for a, histor a future historian. Um, and one of the things that I came across were a bunch of these great big ledger books. Um, and these were the ledger books of the first, the hospital at UVA opened in 1907. Medical school goes way back to Thomas Jefferson, but the hospital opened in 1907. And in these ledger books were lists of the patients, names, where they live, what was wrong with them, and you know, kind of demographic information. And it turns out that patient number 433, you can see her there, Ellen Anthony, turned out to be the second sickle cell patient written up in the medical literature. So in the course of just a few years, I had come across the first and the second sickle cell patients. Uh, and as I said, I tried to, or I tracked down the identities of these people. The same questions came in my mind as I noted who this person was. Who is she? What kind of person was she? So since those days, I've had the opportunity to track down and learn about these two patients and also the physicians who identified sickle cell and wrote about them in the medical literature. These people that I'll be talking about today are pioneers, both the patients and the physicians. Only the physicians knew that they were doing something new. The patients were just sick people who wanted to get better. They never knew that they were the first and second sickle cell patients. The physicians did know as it turned, I mean, could be, as history progressed, as time progressed. The story that I'm going to tell you is a story of contrasts. And you can tell from the title of, this, of the talk some of these contrasts. So I'm going to talk about class, about race, about geographical setting and social setting, about age, and about authorship. The discovery of sickle cell, and you noted in the title I put discovery in quotes. The reason that I put discovery in quotes is because the discovery of sickle cell in 1910 and 11 was only the, the, the beginning for medicine and science to track this disease. And it really did, these two articles really did start something. But we, we people had known about sickle cell without naming it or identifying it for centuries before that. And there is a well-known uh, Ghanaian uh, uh, physician named uh, Dr. Katoni Ahulu, who is able to track his family and sickle cell back three centuries. Um, and he has, I've, I had the opportunity to go to Ghana and hear him speak and on, and in the uh, lobby of this convention center, he had put his family tree up and it showed he had identified those with, he thought, sickle cell based on symptoms, based solely on symptoms. So that's just to say that when we say that sickle cell was discovered in 1910, all we're saying is that we people who are interested in tracking the, the disease and knowing the scientific aspects of it noted it in 1910. It goes way back. So first article is 1910. The second article came out whoops, in 1911, just four months after the first one. And I'm going to tell you about those two. Then, uh-oh, what did I do? Can't get this to advance. I think I was leaning on this and somehow, anybody a computer person here? <laughs> um, I'm not sure how to make this advance. Huh. Whoop, there it goes. Just bang it a few times, right? 
hit it harder, that's it. <laughs> okay, so the third case um, was not recognized and written about until 1915, so four years later, St. Louis, but it referred to the first two cases, and I've highlighted in red that. And then the fourth case was not until 1922, and again, they referred back to the first two cases. So it took 12 years for four cases to be identified. And then there was a flurry of activity. In the 20s, lots of articles came out about sickle cell and um, a variety of discoveries about it were recognized and written about. I'll, and I'll say one of the things that came out of this was this idea that sickle cell was a disease of people of African descent. We know that that's not true. It is in this country, most of the people with sickle cell are people of African descent. But it is also a disease of the Mediterranean region of Italians and Greeks. It is a disease in India and China. Wherever malaria flourished, interestingly, so did sickle cell, and there's a connection between them that people who have one or two sickle cell genes, either from one parent or both parents, have immunity to the worst form of malaria, uh, falciparum malaria, and so there's a, a connection between the two. So, over the remainder of the 20th century, sickle cell in this country became a controversial disease. For example, some people saw the disease as a marker for race. Anybody who had sickle cell disease was labeled as being of African descent. So people who came down with sickle cell and looked white were then accused, I'm not sure what the right word would be, of not being pure in their race. And that was a big deal in the American South. So sickle cell for a while became a marker for race. Um, as I said, we know now that it is not. Um, that race, of course, we know that race is a construct and it's not, um, you can't find genes for race but at the time, that was one of the th things. America is an interesting country. The United States is an interesting country. Um, and its history is very interesting. And this is one example of what makes it um, interesting. Another reason that sickle cell became controversial was that it became a way to keep blacks with sickle cell trait, that is, people with one gene from one parent and not from both. Um, with, it kept them from, for example, becoming pilots in commercial and military settings. If you have one gene from one parent and, are, and are, have what is called sickle cell trait, you are generally asymptomatic and don't show any of the uh, signs or symptoms of sickle cell. The one thing that you can do is pass that gene on to your children. If you have two genes, one from your mom and one from your dad, then you have what's called sickle cell disease. And with sickle cell disease, your lifespan is shortened. Uh, it's gotten much better in recent years, but um, uh, up until the 70s, that was not true. So your lifespan is shortened. You, are, you have a variety of illnesses. You are, um, susceptible to all kinds of infections, strokes. It's a, a very difficult disease. So the thought was that people with sickle cell trait who f flew at high altitudes where the oxygen was thinner would, would be susceptible to suffering uh, some of those medical problems that I just mentioned and wouldn't be fit for being pilots. Not true. But that was another, think, another thought that made the disease controversial. And then um, in the 70s, when sickle cell 
was, uh, became a political thing and there was a, a sickle cell act and there were comprehensive sickle cell centers established around the country and screening programs were established. Instead of it being thought of as a good thing in the African American community, it was thought of as something that whites were trying to do to get rid of people of color in this country. And so gen because genetic counseling um, hadn't progressed very much and the thinking about doing screening hadn't progressed to the idea that it, just because you tell somebody they have sickle cell trait or sickle cell disease, um, there's lots more that you need to tell people besides just that fact. Um, and d recently there's been uh, the screening of athletes uh, has become an issue in the NCAA where the idea that all, all athletes should be screened or should just black athletes be screened because they're more susceptible to uh, disease, the sickle cell, even with sickle cell trait, are they more susceptible to disease? These are all controversial issues that I'm not gonna say more about. None of this was known back in the uh, early 20th century when sickle cell was first recognized. If you wanna read more about this, two books that I would recommend. One is by Keith Whalu, who was just here, as some of you saw and probably heard, and he wrote a book with a wonderful title called Dying in the City of the Blues, and he writes about the politics of sickle cell, and we have a copy here. Melissa's holding it up. Um, and then another book, which is um, very uh, more political even, is Melbourne Tapper's book, In the Blood, uh, Sickle Cell Anemia and the Politics of Race. Uh, so you can go on. Okay, so let's get back to our story. I'm gonna set the scene. The time is the first decade of the 20th century. And the place, there are two places. There's the city of Chicago and the city or town of Charlottesville two uh, communities in North America. Also, that's where the, the medical centers were, also where the patients were from, the tale of two rural areas, the island of Grenada in what was then known as, the, known as the British West Indies, and Campbell County, Virginia, which is just outside of uh, Lynchburg. It's where Lynchburg, Virginia is. The medical setting. This was an exciting time in medicine, the early 20th century. This was time when germ theory, which had been proposed back in the mid 19th and on through the 19th century, was being accepted and, and used to promote health. New bacteria were being discovered and people were fighting to get their names attached to those uh, bacteria. Physical diagnosis was becoming an art that was recognized as a way of seeing inside the body without having to open the body, doing um, st stethoscope, listening with, this, uh, what do you call it, auscultation, and uh, blood pressure cuffs. Um, so physical diagnosis was becoming a, a recognized art. Antisepsis was allowing great strides in surgery that goes along with germ theory. Hospitals became places where people could go to um, get better instead of a place where people died. And there was a growing understanding of the basic sciences, much to the bane of present day medical students, um, biochemistry, physiology, pathology, et cetera, um, were becoming part of medical education and also specialization. As more knowledge was uh, introduced, people could specialize in certain parts of the body or in certain age groups like uh, ear, nose, and throat or surgery or gynecology or pediatrics. So specialization of a variety of things could happen. And with the automobile and the telephone, people could get to doctors and doctors could support themselves by uh, specializing in just one area instead of doing general practice where they took care of all patients who came their way. Hematology, the study of blood, was not a specialty 
in this period, 1900 to 1910. But knowledge of normal blood components and the composition of blood and blood cells, uh, what, what was in blood was um, getting, uh, there was new knowledge in that area, blood uh, slide staining, et cetera, blood counting, that sort of thing. So I just real quickly, I found a few slides uh, from a textbook of that time period. Here's how you would take blood to do, uh, look at blood, that's a slide, and then you would look under the microscope and those are the red blood cells, or the blood cells, it'd be all different white and red blood cells, and you could count with that grid. So leukemias and anemias were being recognized, and hematology was starting to become an integral part of medicine, 1900 to 1910. So that's the medical setting. The social setting. Integration was not part of the social scene, though it, hematology was being integrated into medicine, race was an issue in this country and integration was not happening. This was an era of growing racial segregation and decreasing economic opportunities for African Americans, especially in the American South. But there were islands, what I'd like to call islands of opportunities for African Americans wishing to enter professions, especially in the North, and in some black medical schools in the South. And I've spent a lot of time in my career looking, identifying medical schools for African Americans. And I found 14 between the end of the Civil War and 1920, and have written about them. And I'm not going to spend time on them. I'll just mention that number two is uh, Shaw University had a medical school at Leonard it was called Leonard Medical College. And here's a picture of some uh, students from there from 1889, just to give you a taste of um, the, one of those islands of opportunities. Um, Chicago was one of those islands also. There were a number of medical schools and dental schools that took at least a few people of color. And this is a picture of Provident Hospital uh, in Chicago, which had uh, a nurse training school attached to it. Uh, it was founded by this man, Daniel Hale Williams, who was one of the first black surgeons in this country and did open heart surgery, one of the first open heart surgeries. So, put up this map from the, uh, that island of, I'm sorry, to that island of racial opportunity, Chicago, at the top end of this picture up there, from the island of Grenada down at the bottom, 2,500 miles away in the Caribbean, came the man who became the first sickle cell patient. And I'll just tell you, um, I had the opportunity to go to Grenada in the, uh, 1987, and British West Indies Airways, BWE it was called, had a magazine, you know how uh, airlines have their own magazines? And in the back of the magazine, it had a map. And that's this map here, because it, and the reason I use it is because it shows both Grenada and Chicago on it. So, um, yes? Um, is there a blood type associated with single cell? No, no blood type in particular, no. So any blood type can have it? Any blood type can have sickle cell. Yeah. Okay, so let's tell the story. This is Morton Goldberg. He, in 1987, was the, he's an ophthalmologist, and he was living in Chicago at, and, and taught and practiced at the um, uh, University of Chicago Medical Center. He ran what he said was the world's only sickle cell eye clinic. And he had some grant money and some time on his hands, I guess. He was doing a lot of thinking and he wondered why it was that Chicago was the place where the first sickle cell patient was recognized. What, what happened to make Chicago that place? 
So I got a phone call from this guy. I didn't know him. He had heard about me. Um, I was young in my career and had done a fair amount of writing on African Americans and medicine. And somebody suggested my name to him, I guess. And he called me and said, would you be interested in trying to answer this question? Why is it that Chicago was where the first sickle cell patient was identified? He said, I have some grant money that I can help you to um, provide for your research expenses. And you can be first author, and I'll be second author on this, meaning uh, Savitt would be first author and Goldberg would be second author. And we'll get to the authorship thing at the end because it kind of gets interwoven with the first two cases as well. So I said, yes, I'll do that. Uh, that sounds interesting. And so I wound up going to Chicago and uh, before then I had gotten in touch with the archivist at the hospital that, well, first the hospital, I, I wasn't sure what hospital it would be. Um, I figured somehow that it would be Cook County Hospital where the patient would have been. It turned out that it was Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's Hospital in Chicago. And my first day there in Chicago, I um, talked to the archivist. He had gotten permission from the lawyers in the hospital, as long as I swore that if I ever used his name that I would have the permission of the family to use his name, and I got his name. And now people know that Walter Clement Noel was the first sickle cell patient identified in the medical literature. So he's the man who's written about in that paper that some of you have in front of you. Also discovered that he was a dental student. It said professional student in that article. He was a dental student. There's lots more that um, I can tell about him and I, I will in different parts, but so I'm gonna sh shorten the part about Chicago um, and go on and tell about Grenada, the other, the place where he came from. As you can see, Noel was born in 1884 and died in 1916. He came, here's, here's a map of the island of Grenada. He came from the north end of the island, way up at the top, and I'll, uh, you'll see in a minute, but it's a, um, he, he lived on an estate called Duquesne Estate. He came from an upper class family. This is a man who had money. Well, he had money, his parents had enough money to send him to dental school in the U.S., to a private dental school, Chicago College of Dental Surgery. He came from an upper-class planter family who owned Duquesne Estate near Sautours in the north end of the colony. Grenada is, was, is a very lush island. Lots of tropical crops like bananas and mangoes and coconuts. It's known as the Spice Island because there are lots of spices grown. And lots of water, of course, because it's an island it's surrounded by water. The capital is St. George's on the west side of the island. And here's a picture of it. It's a very picturesque place. This is what one of the streets looked like back in 1905. So as I mentioned, he grew up, Noel grew up you can see it marked up there in yellow, on, uh, in, near the town of Sautours on the north end of the island. Okay, so I got to go to Grenada for a week. Um, I had to convince Dr. Goldberg that it was worth his money for me to go there. I had done all the research that I could. I spent a week in Chicago and found a lot of information, but what I didn't find was information about Noel and Noel's family and the place where all of this happened, where he grew up. 
So I convinced him that I, if he had the grant money that I ought to go there. And he said, okay. So we, my wife and I, flew to Grenada. We paid for her and he paid for me. She went to the hotel and every day I would come back from my research and tell her what I had found. And each day I would go to different places. My biggest helper was this man, Cosmo St. Bernard. St. Bernard is a big name on the island. And Cosmo was a lawyer. He's, last time I saw him in uh, 2010, he was in his mid-80s. And I have not kept up with him. So I don't know if he's uh, still alive. Um, he, uh, I'll say is, is a lawyer uh, on the island and knows everybody. And through a set of uh, interesting coincidences, I found him because he is actually a descendant of Walter Clement Noel. I met him on the first afternoon that I was there doing research. I'd started off in the archives, um, in the birth and death records, etc., and people there said, oh, you need to talk to Cosmo. Um, and so every day I would go to Cosmo and he and I would plot where to go next, you know, who to talk to, what places to go to try to track this down. Because he was as interested in this as I was, because it, it was his family. His cousin, Philip Alexis, this is a picture from uh, August of 87. Um, Philip Alexis, his cousin, lived up on the north end of the island. Cosmo lived in St. George's in the capital city. Philip Alexis lived up on, on the Duquesne estate in a house near the uh, uh, house that uh, uh, Noel grew up in. He is standing here on the steps of Noel's home. That's all that's left of it. And this is the walls of the kitchen, which was a separate building from where <coughs> Noel grew up. Um, I met Philip Alexis also just by chance. I'd gone as far as I could trying to find his house, uh, the house where Noel grew up. And I saw this man walking with a donkey and a little boy. And he came back after he passed me and said, can I help you? I said, I'm looking for the home, the, this uh, Duquesne estate. He said, oh, that's where I live. And he took me there and I met his wife and that was his grandson. It was just, you know, all kinds of interesting circumstances. Noel's parents were Mary Justina Noel, you see her years there, and John Cornelius Noel. Mary Justina lived for a long time, as you can see. She outlived her husband and remarried a man named King. John Cornelius Noel died young, in his 30s, as you can see. We don't know why he died. It is said in the uh, report that you have in front of you that he died with kidney problems, and perhaps he did have um, sickle cell. We don't know. We don't know whether both, whether each parent contributed one gene, um, and that's how uh, Walter Clement got his clemmy, as they called him, got sickle cell, or if um, John Cornelius had both genes. This is a picture that was sitting in the home of Philip Alexis. It is of Mary Justina Noel, and it's the only picture we have of her and as close as we can get to a picture of Walter Clement Noel, and I'll s explain why in a, in a minute. So, Noel grew up on this estate. He then was sent to primary school in the little town of Sartures up on the north end of the island, then went to secondary school in St. George's down in the south uh, end of the island, and then on to Harrison's College, which still exists, in Bridgetown in Barbados. 1901 to 1903. He decided that he wanted to study dentistry. I'm not sure why, we don't know. We do know that he applied to and was accepted at the Chicago College of Dental Surgery and was helped, here's a picture of the building, this is all from the catalog of the school, was helped by this man, Oliver Charles Arthur, who had just graduated from Howard Dental School and had come back to the island and was opening a practice. And it looks like um, Arthur helped Noel 
up, uh, write his medical, uh, dental school applications. At any rate, Noel was accepted into the Chicago College of Dental Surgery, which was a pretty reputable school um, at the time, and then took a ship, we know what ship, the SS Searance, on September 7th. He left Bridgetown, Barbados, and wound up in New York City on the 15th of September. He had less than $70 in his pocket, thanks to uh, immigration records. I could find out how much money he was carrying with him. Uh, kind of interesting. <coughs> Three weeks before Noel left uh, Grenada, his mother wrote a note to the dean of the medical school, of this august medical school, a uh, dental school in Chicago, regarding her 20-year-old son. And I'll tell you how I got hold of the letter in a minute. But this is what she wrote. I will be very glad if you would take an interest in him and see that he does his work, especially as he is a stranger. And I think about that, and I think this is a mother who both cared about her son and also wanted to make sure that he succeeded and was willing to take the risk of writing to this dental school dean and say, watch out for my son. Just something kind of cool about her. And the stories I've heard about Mary Justina is that she was a pretty strong woman um, who pretty much ruled the family. So it kind of fits with my image. Noel got a leg ulcer during the trip to Chicago, uh, during the boat ride from Bridgetown, Barbados to New York. This is just a picture of a typical sickle cell ulcer. And one of the things that happens with um, people with sickle cell is they get these ulcers that take a long, long time to heal. Um, and he got one uh, on the ship. When he got to New York, he saw a doctor. The doctor treated it with iodine. Um, and that's all in that article. And then he went on to Chicago, presumably by train. The ulcer healed with scarring, just like the other ones on his leg, legs. So Noel found rented room, he rented rooms near the school. And number seven on this map of the near uh, west side of Chicago if you're familiar with the area, it's still a very medical area, is where his room was. And number one, you can see just a couple of blocks down, is the Chicago College of Dental Surgery. So he found a room quite close to where he uh, went to school. Catalog showed that he was a part of the freshman class. There he is under the ends, Noel W.C. from the British West Indies. October 5th was the first day of school, uh, 1904. Around Thanksgiving, so a month and a half after he started school, he started getting sick, began to get severe respiratory problems, and cope with them until the day after Christmas, so another month. So he'd been sick for two and a half months with this persistent respiratory problem. He wound up going to Presbyterian Hospital, uh, which was right nearby, and that's number three. So he's living at number seven, and he went to number three, which is pretty much across the street. And this was what it looked like. This was the hospital. Dental students signed, uh, they paid a dollar and got a health plan, and they could go to several places to get their health care. Uh, they paid a dollar for the whole, either it was the semester or the year. So he wound up at Presbyterian Hospital. This is from the annual report of uh, Presbyterian Hospital at that time. He um, would have been seen in an examining room like this. And the lab work would have been done in a laboratory like this. These are all from that same annual report. He was assigned an intern named Ernest Everett Irons, Ernest E. Irons. The attending was James B. Herrick, the guy who wrote the article. And he was admitted to the hospital. Whoops.
So who were the two guys? Uh, I'll just let me show you. So there's Dr. Herrick, the attending, the intern, Dr. Irons. Um, dental, he's a student at the dental school. And you notice the diagnoses there. Um, bronchitis and ankylostomiasis, which is hookworm, question mark. They weren't sure what was going on. So who were the two guys who took care of him? Here's the intern, Ernest E. Irons, who was just about seven years older than Noel. He came from Council Bluffs, Iowa, which is just across the Mississippi from Omaha, Missouri. Missouri. Yep. Just across the Missouri from uh, Omaha, Omaha, and went to Rush Medical School, which was the school where Herrick was teaching. He graduated from Rush in 1903, so he had just graduated when he saw, about a year earlier, when he saw Noel. He earned a PhD in bacteriology in 1912 from the University of Chicago and became the dean of that medical school, Rush Medical School, for 13 years in the 20s and 30s and even became president of the AMA. So he was destined to great things, you might say. His attending was James Brian Herrick, James B. Herrick, who was a generation older than Irons and Noel. Herrick had already earned a bit of a reputation by 1904. He was the attending physician at Cook County Hospital and at Presbyterian Hospital. And here he is doing an operation. You see him down at the foot of the bed in this case. And here he is at Cook County Hospital um, at the head of the bed doing a demonstration. He later, um, let's see. He was a professor of medicine at Rush, had graduated from Rush in 1888, so as I said, a generation earlier. And later on, earned a national reputation for his descriptions of angina pectoris and coronary occlusion. So he was um, well, got to be well known. So back to Irons. Irons did a blood smear. And this is from the actual record. I don't know why. This was in the University of Chicago in the Herrick papers. These, pa these patient records were in there. I don't know why. Shouldn't have been. But they were, um, thank thankfully for me. You can see the picture down at the bottom uh, right there. And he says many elongated forms. This is December 31st, 1904. And I believe these are the first pictures of sickled cells that anyone had done. They couldn't come up with a diagnosis for him over the next four weeks. They considered hookworm, yaws, syphilis, malaria, parasites, a bunch of different things, and ultimately discharged him well, they said. Yes? He had an anemia. Normally, you would expect about 5 million cells, and he had about 2.8. Right. No, there's no question that he had any. They knew that because they had actually been studying. I didn't mention that. Herrick had a keen interest in, in hematology, and so time? <laughs> Goodness. Okay. All right. Condense, condense it, please. I will try to. Okay. Um, all right. I will skip that part. Um, so over the next several months, uh, next three years from 1904 to 1907, Noel saw Herrick and Irons at least three more times, a couple of times in this hospital and in another hospital. And this was one of the records, um, but it shows that Irons was taking care of him. And then in 1907, According to the article that got published in 1910, yeah. When did Sullivan take Irons to the B12 vaccine? I'm I'm sorry. Why did Sullivan take Irons to the? I'll come back to that, okay? When we get towards the end. Um. So, in 1907, he, according to the article, disappeared, and I put up a blank slide. And they never saw him again, the two doctors. So what happened to him? Well, 
he graduated. He graduated from school in 1907 and moved back to Grenada. And there he is in the, in the uh, directory of Grenada, along with Oliver Charles Arthur, his, uh, his buddy, who had helped him. So he graduated in 1907. When I was doing the research for this, one of the places I went was what the dental, the successor dental school to the Chicago College of Dental Surgery was Loyola University in Chicago. And I went there and to the dental school, which is not in existence anymore, it has since gone defunct. And I, was, uh, I went to the dean's office, and that's where I found those letters in his records, in his uh, uh, file, his dean's file, was where I found that letter from Mary Justina Noel. Anyway, so I'm walking down the hallway, and it's got all these class pictures along the wall. And it's got 1909, 1908, 1906, 1905, and I went back because he graduated in 1907. Where's 1907? Nobody knows where the graduating picture of, composite picture of 1907 is. And so we don't have a picture of Walter Clement Noel. His family has no pictures of him. And it's just sad that after all of this that we don't know what he looked like, more or less. Anyway, he opened up an office on the corner of Young and Church Streets in when I was there, it was called the People's Pharmacy. He lived up on the second floor and practiced on the first floor. In 19, uh, 2010, it was a travel agency. Uh, this building still stands. Cosmo helped me um, each day, as I mentioned. And this is a picture from his office to a building across the hall, across the street. One day, he said, you know, there are a couple of elderly ladies who lived up in an estate near where um, Noel lived. Maybe they know something. And he arranged for me, he made a phone call. He knew everybody's phone number. And I watched these ladies go <laughs> answer the phone. I could look out this window and see them answering the phone. Um, anyway, the next day I went for tea. We had a very proper tea and had discussions. They couldn't help me, but they said, maybe Ann Enid can help. So here's Cosmo with the two elderly ladies, and there's Aunt Enid. Aunt Enid, it turns out, was a young student in the Anglican school up the street from Noel's office and had gotten a toothache while Noel was practicing. And she, escorted, of course, by the, the um, steward at the school, because young ladies didn't go out unescorted, went down the street to Noel's office and had a tooth pulled by Noel. And she des described what she remembered of him. And she said he was smartly dressed with dark coffee-colored skin, healthy looking, plump, with a round fat face and a good body. So that's Ann Enid's description of Walter Clement Noel. Noel died in 1916 of pneumonia, a typical cause of death. Um, he wrote a will, so maybe he had a premonition about his death. Don't know, and there's a story with that that I'll, I'll, I won't go into. He's buried on the north end of the island, and one of the things that I like to do is stand where things happened. And so I stood at his grave, and it was a, a wonderful feeling to stand at the grave of Walter Clement Noel. In 2010, on the 100th anniversary of the first article, I got to go back to Grenada. And by then, the cemetery had become a tourist place. They were trying to promote that Walter Clement Noel was the first sickle cell patient. And this is all because of me, you see, because I had done this research and written this, ar written this article that came out in JAMA in 1989 um, identifying who this was. So in 2010, Gloria St. Bernard, the lady in yellow, who is a sister of Cosmo St. Bernard and an Anglican priest and others, they held a ceremony there. And this is the unveiling of the plaque that they put at the entrance to the cemetery. Kind of cool. And the only reason they know who it is is because I was able to identify who that person was. 
And he, so he, this, a hurricane knocked down those tombstones that I showed you in the first picture, and now they've got these uh, other. Okay, so 1910, article comes out. Herrick says, here's um, this case. I don't know what it is. If, can somebody identify what it is? And he puts this article out. He mentions Irons in the article, even though, to my mind, Irons is the guy who first identified the patient and said, hey, look at this patient I have. We ought to take a look. Here's the blood smear, which actually I was able to hold. I held the slides of the blood smear. Those are also in those University of Chicago records. So the article comes out in 1910, November. Benjamin Earl Washburn, who was a medical student at the University of Virginia, you see how all of this gets intertwined with my life, who was a medical student at the University of Virginia and graduated, in, about to graduate in 1911, reads this article in February of, 19, of 1911 and says, hey, I've got a patient who had the same kind of blood problems, and here's his one of his fellow students had taken a blood smear, and this is the blood smear. And so to make the story short, Washburn goes to his professor. Here he is. Washburn went to UNT. He grew up in Rutherfordton, North Carolina, on a plantation. Went to UNC, was an English major. Went to the first two years of medical school here. Then when his professor of English transferred up to UVA, he followed him and went up to UVA and became a medical student for the last two years there. And here, this is he um, a, as a second year medical student. At, uh, this would be at UNC. At any rate, that patient that he had was named Ellen Anthony, the lady that I had come across in that 1907 book of admissions. She lived in near Lynchburg. She came from a farm family. This is all from the article that Washburn wrote. She was a cook, a domestic worker, a laundress whenever she could work, but she was mostly sick. Her family, I could find no information about her family. And I looked everywhere. She's not, the family's not listed in the manuscript census records. I couldn't locate descendants. I went there, interviewed people, met some local historians, and we went around white and black, and nobody could find anything about her. She went to Charlottesville a few, no, 13 times, actually, and was admitted to the hospital there. This was the new University of Virginia Hospital, 1907. And over the next, um, through 1917, was admitted uh, 13 times to the hospital not to a private room like this, but to a ward, and a segregated ward at that. She stayed there for many days. The visit that Washburn met her in, when he had seen the article by Herrick was number five there. She had already been admitted four times before. He wrote an article. He got his professor of medicine, John Stage Davis, the fourth, um, to look at this patient, he said, um, this is a similar patient to the one I have. And my guess is that John Stage Davis said, go write it up. Because this is the second article on sickle cell. Notice it's the exact same title as the first article by Herrick. And you see there's um, the B, the, I'm sorry, the R in Washburn, it says R.E. Washburn, and somebody put a, made it a B because his name is Benjamin. So he goes down in history as R.E. Washburn, not Benjamin Earl. Here it is, R.E. Washburn. How sad. <laughs> <laughs> and as I said, somebody fixed it, and it wasn't me. I got actually <laughs> the librarian said, did you do that? <laughs> Which I didn't. Okay. So, and here are her other admissions. So here is this, the story of contrasts. Look at authorship. In the first case, the attending, Herrick, 
gets the credit. Everybody talks about Herrick and the discovery of sickle cell. Not the intern, Ernest Irons, who I, as I said, think was probably the guy who at least alerted uh, Herrick and did a lot of the, the work seeing this patient. <coughs> the second case, it's the medical student who gets the credit, not the attending, because Davis gave it to him. Interestingly, when, remember I told you at the beginning that um, Dr. Goldberg said, you can be first author and I'll be second author. When we submitted this article to JAMA in 1989, um, the editors of JAMA said, what did Dr. Goldberg do? What role did he play? What was, why does he merit authorship? And I had to say that he didn't write it, he didn't do the research, it was his idea, but he, all he did was um, read what I had written, made a few corrections, passed around to a few people, and gave it back to me with a few notes. But for the most part, it was my research, my article. And they almost didn't put Goldberg's name on it, but they did in the end. Goldberg, was an, he was the editor of the Archives of Ophthalmology, so he was a pretty well-known guy, and I, didn't, I think they didn't want to do battle with him. So whatever. So there was an authorship issue in the article that we published about this. And, you know, it was his idea, so I, I give him a lot of credit for that. So contrast in the patients. There were lots of opportunities for a man like uh, Noel in the United States, but not for Ellen Anthony. Noel could move from the West Indies to Chicago and go to dental school. Ellen Anthony was trapped in the segregated South. She's anonymous. In the, there are no records of her. She's invisible, even in the records of the time. Noel was the social, economic, and professional equal of doctors Irons and Herrick. He was smart articulate, and I don't mean that in a degrading way, he was well-educated. He could speak to them on their level, from the West Indies, not from the American South. How many patients had they seen in Chicago of color with sickle cell and didn't do the blood smear? Why did they do it on Walter Clement Noel? Why did it take a foreigner, a foreign patient, somebody from another country, to look at that blood smear where they could have done it on, on any of the patients, uh, uh, African-American patients who they saw. He was educated, he had money, he had that wonderful West Indian accent, he could give a good history of his past, he was a student and was at a private hospital. Ellen Anthony was the exact opposite in all these ways from Washburn and John Stage Davis IV. So, interesting story about, as I said, race, class, authorship, um, and sickle cell anemia. So I've given you two stories, um, and all what we have left are these two blood smears. That's what's left of these two patients and their legacy um, to today. So I'll stop there. Thanks for listening. I hope I didn't go too long over. Okay, uh, a couple things here. If you have not signed in, please do so. That's basically your fee for attending. Um, if you are with the wellness program, is anybody here with the wellness program? Attending because of that, okay. But if you were, you'd see Lindsay. Um, we've got, we will put the, I will bring you the, uh, microphone because we like having both the question and the answer on uh, tape and you did, uh, Todd, you did uh, kind of put the question in as part of your answers for the couple that came up in the middle. Uh, we've got some books up front that you're welcome to look at and, and you can take away if you, if you like. You can check them out. Um, I'm going to put a, make up a bibliography of these four uh, articles plus Todd's, and we'll put that 
um, also up online. And got one more thing to here. Uh, we were looking, I was looking through our records, you know, what did we have on sickle cell anemia uh, that was historical? And some of you know, remember Dr. Waugh. Um, he wrote an article um, in 2003 that included sickle cell anemia. And I know that he was also very interested in kidney disease. And we have a, at le have at least part of a disassembled very early uh, a dia dialysis, excuse me, dialysis machi is machine from him. So uh, somebody rose, oh, okay. I think. You were first. <laughs> so that's really fascinating. How long after these first two reported cases were there enough additional cases reported to get to a critical mass where it began to be recognized as a, as a condition going forward? The 20s, the 1920s, yeah. So Johns Hopkins, the two places um, where researchers really took off were Johns Hopkins um, and Medical College of Georgia. Uh, a guy named Seidenstricker in Georgia and a guy named Huck in, um, it, at Johns Hopkins. And they were kind of rivals to, uh, but they both began to recognize the, that they were seeing lots of patients or a number of patients with this condition. Uh, let me answer the question that this young lady had about, um, you were asking about vitamin B12? Yeah, like iron medicines. Iron medicines. It doesn't work with sickle cell because it's not going to, it doesn't cure the problem. There are so many other issues with sickle cell that it doesn't get rid of the sickled cells. The reason that cells sickle is, has to do with oxygenation and other things beyond my uh, ability to explain. But the iron doesn't, doesn't make a difference. Um, I know we have a physician in the audience if, if you wanted to. Add to that. Um, I, wonder, I wanted to ask a different question. Are there any descendants of Noel? Okay. There the are. Next question. No, not, see, he didn't have any children. Okay. He never married and never had children. The other side of the family, she, his mother remarried a king, but they would, that would only be half the family, so we don't know. The other thing is interesting in 1910, the most people with sickle cell died as teenagers, like early teenagers, right. like 10 or 12 years of age. Right. So if he died at age 30, and the other lady as well, I wonder whether they had like a sickle uh, beta, or a sickle alpha, right. or a sickle hereditary persistence, uh -huh. not just a traditional right. sickle cell disease, yeah. and it would be nice to look into the family trees yeah. and figure that out. And it's hard to know what they had. You're right. I mean, he apparently didn't suffer a lot of the problems that a lot of people with sickle cell have. And so he may not have had SS, pure SS. He may have had a, a, another kind, um, but we don't know that. I wonder if you would touch on how um, Doctors at the African American hospitals might have been cataloging patients with this similar disease, or if there was some kind of history of um, African American folk medicine dealing with this kind of disease. Um, the first part of your question about black physicians in clinics, you're talking about um, later on? No, I mean, it, I'm surely sickle cell patients were coming into African American hospitals, and I, they may not have had the technology to see the, you know, hematology. Right. So how were they? Were they at all cataloging these? Symptoms? They didn't know. They, there were no. In those days, blood testing was just starting, and so even to to figure out those bloods or the symptoms, one of the things sickle cell is called the great imitator. It mimics a lot of other conditions. And so it, only if you get a cluster of the similar kinds of problems that are uh, hallmarks of sickle cell could you identify it just from the symptoms. You really need to do electrophoresis or blood tests, which didn't, weren't around then. So 
and black hospitals were few and far between. I mean, the one in Pro at Providence in Chicago was one of the few black hospitals. So uh, they just didn't know. They, they weren't aware. Can we turn on the lights? Is that possible? Okay, uh, you can hear from the way I'm talking, I'm not an American. I'm a Nigerian. Uh -huh. And I have the opportunity of seeing sickle cell all across the board, you know. Um, there was a time when I was growing up, I thought maybe I have an AS2 because I have cousins, friends, colleagues, everything having the illness. No, um, I was so much impressed with the, the leg or side picture you brought up there. That one, that one was very, very common with them there. So, uh, because we have the malaria there with a couple of infections, you know. The, the, if you really want to see a real picture of um, sickle cell disease, I don't know, going to Africa where it originated from, I can say if I see someone that has sickle cell disease, I don't have to. I was talking, talking to one of my colleagues that we work together. That if I see someone with sickle cell disease, I don't need to talk to them. I know the way they look. Very thin and tall. Tall, long limbs. Uh -huh. And then one thing that's very common because they have the rapid um, um, breaking down their wrists, uh -huh. they always come with jaundice. Uh -huh. Which is not right. Really Yellow common. eyes. Yeah. yeah, there are so, all kinds so of. A, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of things are very interesting thing that uh, yeah, disease that uh -huh. cuts across. You know. Right. I, 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 I'm so impressed that here there's much because of the facilities. You know, they are much <coughs> better than what they were there back home. You know, back home in back in Nigeria and other African countries. Uh -huh. you know, so just to say, it's, it's okay. a comment, not a. Report. Thank you. Thanks, sir. I appreciate your presentation, too. I have a question. Irons is a, is a prominent last name here in medical, in, in medical history. Um, there are, the, the Irons family have, have produced several, lo, have had several local physicians. It, is, is there any indication that they're related or not related? No, they're not. As far as I know, I mean, maybe way back, but I've talked to, to Dr. Irons uh, about when I first discovered all of this, I, I went and talked to him. And as far as I know, I mean, I haven't tracked the family tree back, but I, we don't know of any direct connection okay. with the Greenville Irons. <laughs> it, it just seemed like the, the question sure. that, that uh, local people would be interested in. Any other questions? I have some articles about stuff that I've written. If anybody's interested in the second sickle, I have an article that I wrote about the second sickle cell patient and um, a couple of articles about the history of sickle cell that I have a few copies of somewhere here. I'll be glad to share them with you. But thanks for coming and listening. And, uh, and again, if you have